Okay, now it looks good. Looks good. I'm just missing students. I can see that. So they have no viewers. So I'm gonna wait a little while to get you in. And while you're joining in, I'm gonna put the soccer team on. Mm hmm. <clears throat> what is this? What is this? Still, it looked like I got no views here. Oh, now, uh, yeah, now people finally started to collect together. Not many viewers yet, just four. But I trust that momentarily we get to go. Maybe that's because of me. I was um, struggling a little bit up with my uh, streaming key. So, so maybe you got the warning that the lectures are on just a few minutes back. I'm going to go and get some water and wait that you guys are able to settle down. And then we will go. Just. Okay, just putting my Socrative on as well. And he's on. <clears throat> Great. All right, we'll be back in uh, 15 seconds. So, good afternoon. Oh yeah, one more thing that I need to go and collect. I need to get my pen. So here it is. Any comments about midterm exam? quite convinced that it was exactly what I created. Uh, there should be, at least I made it intentional in a way that there is no surprises whatsoever. And, and I'm sure that the, the question that is in your head is that, okay, when is that you're gonna get the results? Uh, we'll answer those, that question momentarily. Uh, I have 
honestly, I haven't taken a look about the results, so I have no idea how well you scored. So you just need to stay tuned, and later you will learn how was your scoring. But anyways, so today we're going to discuss about, well, first of all, we will get started from the practical matters. So I want to explain a little bit of what happens in the, this period number four, so last period of this academic year. And once we're done with the practical matters, then still a few things about motor reduction, because uh, prior to exam, midterm exam, I was unable to complete the, the explanations about um, Craig Pumpton method. So I shortly want to show that to you. I, I'm not planning to spend that much of a time for it, but just shortly a highlights of that method. And then something that is um, honestly a little bit of boring matter, which is related to mass invariance. Oh, battery is low. So the mass invariance, this guy here, that's something that uh, I want to spend, um, let me let me think, 10 minutes max, five to 10 minutes. There's a lot of slides in that regard, but many of the slides are very mechanical. I mean, very mechanical mathematics which I'm hoping you not to pay too much of attention to. So, uh, and now let me see what happened. So there's again, warning about the beat rate. So is the problem in my voice. So it says something about the beat rate is lower than the recommended beat rate. We recommend that I don't see what it says. So do you guys have any comments? How is my voice today? No comments so far. Let me know if it is no good. Okay, then uh, an interesting technical topic that is also with the quite a bit of practical relevance is a contact modeling. This is something that you do need, whatever you, sound is fine. Okay, everything is fine. So content modeling is something that you definitely need if you wanted to use any kind of practical modeling, right, any kind of practical simulation task, or if you want to get involved with any kind of practical simulation task. And uh, today we're going to learn also when I'm opening this when I'm opening this contact modeling topic, we're also going to learn what is uh, many body dynamics. So so far you know what is a multi body dynamics which means that there is a multiple bodies, but what is a many body dynamics? And uh, the many body dynamics is related to how the interactions between many bodies are described. And that's what we're gonna learn a little bit later today. There's, it's even possible that I'm unable to wrap up this contact modeling today. So we need to get back to that a bit later in this course. All right, practical matters. Now, as promised, I want to keep this this course in a level that provides you a good picture about simulation in general. And in that regard, we're gonna or I have invited a number of visiting lectures to give you highlights about different applications, different um, fields where the simulation can be applied. And it will get started next week. So the next week there will be a visiting lecture delivered by Adam Klodowski. Oh, excuse me, made a mistake. Of course, it's not the Adam Klodowski, but Dr. Adam Klodowski. And it's interesting. It's about the biomechanics. Uh, that's uh, essentially how all these methods you'll be learning in this course, and also the course that was delivered in the fall, can be used in uh, in the human modeling to understand the human behavior, not human behavior, but the human mechanics, biomechanics. And uh, once that is done, then we're gonna look a little bit about the product life cycle management. And this uh, lecture is something that gives you a little bit of perspective to business uh, concept and business frameworks. And that will be delivered by a researcher from LUT University, so Ilka will be the one that is delivering that. And then maybe the highlight of the entire course, maybe the highlight of the, your entire master level studies will follow. 
and that will be the week number 13. And the title or the, the subject matter is a bicycle dynamics. So you may wonder like, okay, bicycle dynamics, is there anything to discuss about bicycle dynamics? Well, you're gonna find it out that later, but that will be delivered by my good friend, Professor Aaron Swap. Uh, Aaron Swap is coming from Delft University, which those of you that are monitoring the university rankings tells quite a bit as Delft is one of the best universities in Europe. The story is very fascinating. It's extremely nice story. And it tells a little bit about enthusiasm and how is that you can accomplish something nice once you get really interested about something that you feel that is important. And now what Aaron did, he got excited about bicycles and he wanted to, to figure it out. What is uh, dynamics behind the bicycles? At that lecture, all the stories about how he, were, how he got in, interested about bicycles how he was uh, carried away with the bicycles, that all you're gonna learn in end of this month. And also uh, tells really about what's the power of the simulation, quite a bit about that, exciting story. I'm very, you know, this is my favorite lecture for sure. And then what follows is finite term modeling. Finite term modeling is something that is very, very often used. and we do know what it is we know the displacement based finite element but we're still lacking the information about multiphysics simulation and how finite term modeling could be possibly used in multiphysics simulation who's going to deliver that lecture that's uh, unclear to me this time but i will get back to you a bit later and then something that i'm excited again i'm excited it's a future of simulation that's the one that I'm planning to deliver to deliver for you. So that's a little bit of subjective point of view, but I'm trying trying to tell you what is it you can expect to see next in a field of simulation and how the simulation will be used in different product processes. So far, we've been emphasizing and focusing mainly on product development, but my lecture in 14th of uh, April is more about what is that we could do in the simulation and how the simulation can be applied to other product processes than the product development. And that I hopefully, hopefully you find that interested. Then that's it. So this is going to be today's lecture and the five first lectures that will be part of your next midterm exam. So that's going to be a total of six lectures. The last one, which is not mandatory. So you follow if you find it interested. That's going to be the career counseling, extra lecture, lecture that I promised to deliver to you. And again, something that I, I wanted to share my thoughts, my I want to give my observations regarding the career counseling. And of course, the career counseling, we're going to look at the two different ways of careers. careers. We're going to think about, we're going to look a little bit about what is an academic career, a little bit about the industrial career. And most Particularly, we are looking at the ways, how is it you can find your way to industry. That's going to be the, my main message. It's easier, in my mind, to find your way, at least in the beginning, to academia. And what are the special features in academia versus industry? I would like you to be aware of those things. And if you don't like to hear my career counseling tips, then... Uh, just skip it. Um, then the question is that will we have 25 in-class quizzes this this semester? Mm, well, I think we have a total of 25, if I remember correctly. To be honest, the number is off of my head, so I don't remember exactly what was mentioned in the first lecture. But but I can guarantee you that if you're following, say, 70% um, of the lectures and you're able to answer correctly, 70% of the in-class quizzes, you will get that extra point that you need to upgrade your final grade. All right. Uh, results of the midterm will be available in week 11. So next week they will be available and I will organize a separate team session for that midterm exam. So it's going to be 
something that you will have an opportunity to file a complaint. You can um, get, you know, my reasoning why that I you scoring whatever you were scored, and um, and basically it's kind of feedback to you. And uh, you can use this opportunity or you can simply skip it. But it's going to be next week. I need to get back to the details, like when exactly, but probably, most probably, right after Adam Kolodovsky's uh, lecture. So that's going to be a little bit longer team session than usually. And again, the purpose of that longer team session, teams session, is that you can take a look at your midterm exam grading, and we can discuss. And of course, the, the purpose of the discussion in your perspective would be to try to upgrade uh, the final number. Okay. But that next week. That's going to be next week. Okay. So that's about the visiting lectures. That's about practical matters. So some exciting things ahead. So stay tuned. Um, all the visiting lectures, I've been following all these visiting lectures and they're they are great pleasure for sure. And different, different point of views, definitely. All right. So now one's uh, explaining what is going, what will happen in the future. So time to jump back to the less exciting things. So let's close the case about modern reduction. And let's look about the method that is very often used. And if you're using a commercial software, finite element software, and a commercial multi-body software, so typically the way these two softwares can be combined is a method based on Craig Bumpton modes. And again, it's in one kind of way how these deformation modes can be computed. So let me refresh your mind. So it's all about this. So it's all about how we combine finite element and multi-body system dynamics. So first of all, why we want to combine that? Well, we want to combine these two uh, disciplines and two approaches because you can get the better accuracy if you are capable to describe mechanical deformation. And the most common, most general way to make it happen is by using the floating frame reference formulation. So what is the deal with the floating frame reference formulation then? Well, the deal is this. So you're introducing the reference coordinate system that is floating with the body. Remember, we discussed about the floating concept earlier. And then you're describing the deformation with respect to this floating coordinate system. And uh, let's say that here's a point that due to the deformation will move this much. This vector u bar will be the one that is described by using finite element method. Reference motion with respect to this guy, with respect to global coordinate system, will be described by using multi-body system dynamics. So that's how you're combining these two things. And we concluded earlier that um, you cannot really combine that in a way that you take any finite element model and you just compute the vector u bar. And the reason behind is that the vector u bar is describing nodal decrease of freedom. And typical finite element model that is used in practical applications consists of very high number of degrees of freedom. So it can easily have, let's say that if you have this kind of plate kind of structure, it can easily have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands degrees of freedom. It's meaning that this vector u bar is having overly many unknowns. And you need to do something to that. So you need to reduce the size of your finite element model. And possible ways to make it happen is that you can use a less elements, which is not recommended in finite element modeling because in finite element modeling, the solution gets better once you're increasing the number of elements. Remember this convergency. Convergency means that you get better and better solution once you keep on increasing the number of elements. So reducing the size of the 
or number of the elements is not really feasible way to go. So you need to figure out something else. So what you can do then is that you can find what are the possible deformation mode of entire structure, entire structure here. Uh, once you look at this entire structure, that the way the entire structure can deform, then you can actually move from nodal degrees of freedom to modal degrees of freedom. This conversion can be carried out by using a naked value analysis. And in naked value analysis, you're basically looking at the feature of the structure, meaning that you're not looking at forces itself. All right. And you can get deformation mode. And this deformation modes will be multiplied by the amplifications, modal coordinates, if you may. And now this is a thing we do here. And this is what makes it possible to reduce the size of the problem. A little bit of lengthy explanation, but hopefully you were able to follow me. Now, earlier, even prior to midterm exam, we concluded that these Aiken value analysis can be carried out in many different ways. We can have uh, many different set of boundary conditions. Boundary con condition means like, how is this structure finite element model is connected to crown, if it is connected to crown, because it's possible that it's also having no boundary condition at all. And then it means that it's floating in a space. But we could also introduce boundary condition here. And, uh, you know, this is not easy task to do. So that's something that is quite complicated. And uh, another problem that is related to this conventional use of Aiken value approach is that there may be some local deformation due to the joints. So maybe there is a revel joint here. And revel joint is introducing some local deformation, which is hard to account by using these uh, deformation modes that are coming from the Nakin value analysis. Maybe there is a uh, forces, pin forces like this one here that too is introducing some local deformation. So these local deformations are hard to capture because uh, they have some very narrow effect to, to entire structure, but sometimes very critical effect. So is there any other way than using conventional Aiken value analysis to get these deformation modes? And I'm guessing that you know the answer already. Yes, it is. There is a way to make it happen, alternatively. And this alternative way is called Craig Bumpton method. Actually, there's many, many other methods too. That's like Krillov subspace. And many other methods that are capable to produce this deformation modes to you. But let's look at the one method that is, as mentioned earlier, is often used. So Craig Pumpton method. What is the deal with that? So the deal of the Craig Pumpton method is as follows. You take your finite element model, like the plate-like structure shown here. You know, this plate-like structure is modeled by using, oh, oh, hold on, hold on. So it's modeled by using plate elements. And it consists of relatively high number of not a degrees of freedom. So nodes are the ones that are connecting the neighboring bodies. So all these crossings are here, places where the nodes are located at. And the plate element typically have six degrees of freedom per node allocation. That's three translations, three rotations. So uh, what we can do for this model is that we can select uh, not a degrees of freedom or better to say, we can categorize our nodal degrees of freedom to two different categories. The first category is called boundary degrees of freedom. So what are these boundary degrees of freedom? Those are the ones that may experience that local deformation that is due to the joint or due to the pin force, or something that you are particularly interested in, something that you would really like to see the details of that particular location. If no other interesting point, at least the one that are used as a place where the joints are introduced, or where the, this plate-like body is connected to other body 
in multi-body model. And those will be the boundary degrees of freedom. So you're selecting, okay, here's one node and here's another node that I'm particularly interested. I would like to see how they're performing locally. Uh, this is where this is where I'm going to connect my structure to uh, neighboring bodies in my multi-body code. All right, so you're calling them as a boundary decrees of freedom. Let's just first do this selection and think nothing further. Okay, that's your first category. Second category is rest. All the rest. All the rest decrees of freedom. All the rest not a decrees of freedom. Those will be called as a interior decrees of freedom. So obviously, boundary decrees of freedom number wise is much slower. I mean, not slower, lower than the interior decrees of freedom. So typically you may have like, let's say, one to or two to ten nodes that are selected as a boundary decrease of freedom. If these nodes has a six degrees of freedom, so it could be say twelve to sixteen uh, degrees of freedom that are selected as a boundary decrease of freedom, and rest will go to this interior decrease of freedom. And now, if you have a model with a hundred thousand degrees of freedom, well, there's going to be quite a bit that goes to this interior category. All right. Then what happens mathematically? And you don't need to worry about the mathematics that much, but I'm still gonna explain that to you. What happens mathematically is that you're gonna reorganize your mass and stiffness. That's the way that these coordinates that are associated to boundary decrease of freedom will be located in upper left corner of your mass matrix and your stiffness matrix. So it's reorganizing. So you can change the order of rows and columns as you want. That's that's okay. So you can do it if you want. And that's what is exactly is made here. All right. So now this is based on the selection you made earlier. Then you're gonna do a little bit of computing. And a little bit of computing is that you're gonna select first sub matrix of your stiffness and mass which are all related to interior decrease of freedom. So going back to this slide here, so you're selecting decrease of freedom that are everything else except the boundary decrease of freedom. And you can use them. So is this guy and this guy, and you can use them to conduct an Aiken value analysis. All right, so you get again, Aiken values, deformation modes. And now you may wonder like, Oh my God, so what, what is the deal with this? So first you say that this is a different method than Aiken value analysis, and now you say that it's an Aiken value analysis. It is, it is this. This is gonna be the first set of modes that is based on Aiken values. But the power of the method is the fact that we can have another type of modes. And these other type of modes will be something that will be will having this capability to describe local deformation. That's why this is a general method and easy to use because no heavy thinking is needed. All right, let's just conclude that we have the first set of modes which will be coming from Aiken value analysis. But because we're only looking at the interior decrease of freedom, this deformation mode will be something that, like if I give you an example, I have here a beam element and I'm selecting this node and this node has a boundary decrease of freedom. And then the deformations, I need to change the color to make this more visible to you. Now these vibration modes will be something that I'm gonna attach my structure from these points to ground. And then I'm looking at how the rest of the structure behaves when I'm conducting the naked value analysis. So it's gonna be the deformation modes, roughly something that I was about to draw in here. That's maybe the lowest deformation mode Second one may be a bit more complicated and so on and so forth. All right, then this is just a half of the story. Rest of the story goes like this. All right, then we're gonna uh, compute static deformation that is due to the displacement. So I'm gonna introduce unit displacements and the unit displacement will be made by using this equation here. So I'm gonna look at only the stiffness, no inertia, just the stiffness here. And how am I gonna make it happen? I'm gonna make it happen in such a way that I'm gonna first 
set the forces to be zero and I'm so then solving this guy here from that equation. Okay, this guy here, okay, don't, don't look at the details of the equation because I'm gonna explain what this means to you momentarily. So this one, what you get as a result will be unit displacement. Sorry, that line is not very straight. This is again my beam-like structure. And then you're introducing unit displacement to these boundary degrees of freedom one at a time. So it could be unit displacement here. So the deformation would be like this. No, actually, I'm sorry, made a mistake. Not like that. I need to redraw that. So here are my boundary degrees of freedom. So I'm gonna introduce unit displacement like this. So nothing here, this will be moved one unit to y direction, so the rest will be like this. So it's like curved like this. Okay, then I'm gonna introduce a unit displacement to x direction, rotation, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna look at the look a little bit about the, how is a displacement based mode, displacement based mode. All right, that's that's it. Now I'm pretty much ready. So I have two different set of modes, which I'm gonna put in a one package. And the one package, well, simply combined like it is mathematically shown here. So I'm gonna get two different set of modes, fixed interface normal modes, what a monster name, and static modes. And again, here's an example structure to you. This is a beam-like structure again. And in this beam-like structure, I'm selecting mm, decrease of the node in them, left and right, and the node in the middle to be those boundary decrease of freedom. Just a second. All right. Now, first set of modes, which is coming from this Aiken value, part of the, the step or the, the procedure, will look like this. So these places will be attached to crown, and the deformations look like this like this. And that the rest will have this unit displacement. Here's an example how the unit displacement in the middle look like. Unit displacement here in the left end would be something like this. Unit displacement here in the right end would be like this. So this is my another set of mode. So combining, simply put them in a one package. That's it. I could stop this process here. And after it is stopped here, there is, however, one minor beauty mistake here. And the beauty mistake is the fact that these static modes are not mathematically orthogonal. Is that a serious problem? No, it's not a serious problem, but some people really prefer to have all the deformation modes to be orthogonal. Why? Well, remember that you, what you're gonna do with these modes is that you can uh, compute mass and stiffness based on these modes. And now if these modes are orthogonal, results are diagonal representations, which is having some mathematical advantages. And if they are not orthogonal, then it's not gonna be diagonal. And that's gonna be the minor problem which can be fixed. And this is what we're gonna do next. So we're fixing the problem by brutal force. And the brutal force goes such that I'm gonna take my, my two set of modes that I combine together. <clears throat> I'm gonna compute my new mass matrix based on these uh, deformation modes. And I'm gonna combine my new stiffness matrix the similar way. These ones will be will not be will not be diagonal and again why not because the static corrections these unit displacement modes are not orthogonal and and that's a problem that can be fixed in such the way that you take these result matrices and you conduct one more time on Aiken value analysis this one more time Aiken value analysis is called orthonormalization what a monster name again. Orthonormalization is forcing all the modes to be orthogonal. Okay, 
Is it good? Well, at least it helps. It helps. Because what you're going to get as a result will be then orthogonal modes. These are orthogonal modes. And now if you're combining or if you're using these orthogonal modes and multiply them by this stiffness matrix, the result will be diagonal representation. So let's summarize. Let's summarize. You get started by combining two set of modes. First one is based on Aiken value analysis. And it's going to be based on Aiken value analysis such that boundary degrees of freedom will be attached to ground. Like this. And then you're combining, you're computing a number of deformation modes. The most exotic ones will be like, like this, and so on and so forth. And then uh, you compute another set of modes, which is based on the unit displacement. So introducing unit displacement, the boundary degrees of freedom one at a time. Here it looks in the middle when you introduce a unit displacement one in the y direction. This will be the same the x direction. The rotation will look a little different. And this is, you do the same for this and this point as well. Okay. Now you get two set of modes, which are already okay. But having this problem that these static correction modes do or not, or excuse me, are not orthogonal. And this problem you can fix, but oh, oh, hold on. Let me see, I'm here. So this problem you can fix by using the, this monster process or procedure called orthonormalization. Orthonormalization forces all the modes to be orthogonal. So what happens to these original modes? Well, they will, they will lose their origin. So they will look completely different and they look roughly free free modes. And they will look something that there is a very whole, very heavy local deformation. These local deformations are at the place where these boundary degrees of freedom are located at. And that helps you to introduce joints, pin forces and others and make it accurate. Okay. Why to use Craig Pumpton? And now, now you need to put your other stuff away because this is what I'm about to ask in my in-class quiz. Okay, why it makes sense to use Craig Pumpton method? I need to make my soccer day ready. Okay, so it makes sense to use it because it allows to describe local deformation due to the forces and joint. That is a reason. and. Uh, and it, you know, that is a primary reason to use it. And uh, because of that reason, it's general purpose method. And now comes my in-class quiz. And my in-class quiz is this. Crick Bumpton method is often used approach because it allows to describe local deformation due to the forces and joints. It can be used for beam-like structures. It can be used for plate-like structures. It allows structural, it allows to describe structural damping. And now let me put my, hold on. No, I'm not, I'm not sure if what's going on in my, those of you that were in the soccer day, I think that I deleted you, not intentionally, but I think, okay, now I see that you're on. Okay, and now uh, you already start to enter your answers. Two answers so far. I have 30, 32 views. That's a good number. I'm happy to see that number. Maybe you guys were expecting to see the results of your midterm exam, but not today. So it's going to be next week. All right. But what do you say? I have 10 answers, so it looks okay. And now somewhere down here below all the windows, I need to go and check it out. How is my OBS? And here are the, okay, better to put it off for a little while. So soon we're gonna take a look at how are the results. Going back to this question that uh, was prior to midterm exam about, is it possible to see face to face? Maybe it's possible. I don't know. Right now, it's not looking too promising, but 
universities closed until uh, April 6th, if I remember correctly. But, you know, the, the class, this class or this course will go until um, Labor Day. And uh, that's going to be 1st of May. So maybe we still have a chance to meet. We'll see. If not, then we can organize some other kind of course party, some kind of graduation party from this course. No, that's a master degree, but that's this course. We'll see how it goes. And let me see how many answers I have. I have 19, 20, 20 already. And 21. So this is my soccer leave. So I'm going to, I think I, what I will do today is that I'm going to leave this open for another minute or so. And then I will jump back to it because I have a few slides that is explaining a little bit about practical matters of modeling. Now here are the, just the practical th tips for you. You know, when you're combining finance element, uh, and multi-body system dynamics, oh, the writing is so difficult. Using the floating frame reference formulation. These are related to that. So in theory, element time can be selected without limitation. However, usually selection is with between the solid and plates. Solid is very, very often used because solid modeling, I mean, modeling structures using solid finite element is very common at the moment. It used to be very different. And it used to be very different because the CPU power was limited. But at the moment, there's a so much CPU power that usually people do not pay much of attention to element types. They're simply modeling everything by using solid elements. Of course, there's a certain limitations, like if you have a hollow cross-section, very long, very thin beam, beam structure like this, and this is hollow cross-section. Let's see how it, how it draws here, like this. Of course, it makes no sense to model this kind of structure using solid elements. And why not? Well, because, you know, you need to use very, very tiny element to model this kind of structure and eventually you will have a millions and millions of elements. And that's simply because solid elements cannot be distorted too much. Distortion means that if they're having cubical shape initially, like roughly this much, you cannot stress them too much because that's going to be very bad for the numerics. So if you stretch them a lot, you're going to get the solutions that are no longer acceptable. But you can model this by using plates, or this is a simple structure, so we would do it the job. So anyway, so most often use our solid and plates elements. Any kind of like a special elements will be a little hard to use because uh, you need to make sure that the element having the three-dimensional degrees of freedom or three-dimensional not a degrees of freedom. Well, it says here that the beam-like structures are often very simple, so you can model them by using lamp mass approaches. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can do that, but it's no, it's okay to use the floating frame reference formulas. Rigid body modes need to be removed when using Craig Pompton method. That's obvious because rigid body modes, motion, reference motion, it describe, it's described by using reference coordinate system. So don't make a double description for rigid bodies, rigid body motion. So make sure you remove that when using Craig Pompton method. And finite sum models used in a structural strength, strength analysis, it's okay to use as they are. Symmetrical models, which you may not be even aware of, but they used to be very much in fashion when I was young, let's put it this way. You shouldn't use that because, you know, then it becomes really cumbersome to describe inertia properties correctly. So forget about that. So make sure that you have entire structure model and use that. All right, let's see how is that we're doing in, uh, in class quiz. So let me jump back to this guy. And do we have a game on? Yes, we do. Okay, I want to participate. My answer is this. Look at that. Very low numbers. I'm saying 56, 56. My reasoning is this, um, well, I was thinking that you are kind of not expecting to get the so 
in class quiz that like I just saw it to you. So I'm thinking that half of you, almost half of you are surprised about this. So you are not sure what to, you know, how to answer this correctly. So we'll see how, who is right about this. Others, <laughs> okay, so, so others, so do we have, I don't, we don't have that many players in the game, but I, I like that the one that is saying 100%, I like it. I like, would be nice to be with you, but I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot. All right. And I was so wrong. I was so wrong about this. You know, look at this. So it's extremely good. 93, 93. That's awesomely good. I'm sorry that I was having some doubts about your performance. My mistake. My apology. My apology. So, okay. So we got, I think we got the quite a, quite a good number of winners here. So 94 will be considered as a winner. Mm hmm Then uh, 95 will be considered as a winner. And yeah, 95, there's another 95. Yeah, yeah, 95 is okay. Yeah, it's good, it's good. So it's considered as a winner. Uh, let me see. 93, well, it's uh, 93 and 90, 94. Okay, so we've got quite a quite a good number of winners here. Quite a good number of winners. Uh, here it goes. And then one more here. Yeah, 91, why not? Why not? 91 is close enough, close enough. Let me see, what's the 91? 91. Yep. Yeah. Of course, it's you. Okay. So with that, let me put it off. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Everything above fifth. What is it? Fifty. <laughs> yeah. That. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Why not? So everyone that is saying better than I did, so you know you can get the extra point. Why not? I need to take a screenshot of this. Just a second. Yeah, that, by the way, why I haven't made this earlier, so it's much more easier to do this way. Hold on here. Queen shot. Okay, I got it. And now we're going back to the business. Let's hide this one. All right, then I have another in class quiz that is not so simple. So it's about in the floating frame reference formulation, rigid body modes need to be removed. And this holds for Craig Pontum and it, re it holds for other methods too. And the um, uh, options are, rotations are assumed to be small. Deformations are assumed to be small. Reference coordinate system takes care of the rigid body motion. Damping is assumed to be insignificant. Game is on game is on. Oh, no, he's not yet on because uh, I'm left behind in my stroke the um, here. You should be able to see it now. User interface in Socrative is a little different than it used to be. So it makes me feel a, a bit unsure what's going on, but I got the first answer. So it's all good. All good. <clears throat> Okay, so well, let's keep this a little while and then a uh, couple more slides about this deformation mode. And where is my pointer here? And then something else, something a little different. All right, you guys think about this and I'm gonna show you a few things. These are Adam's software or user phrase from Adam's software, which is, you know, no difference than user interface of other software. So it's more or less same. And question is that how is that we can select, you know, which one, which one out of the many modes is the most significant ones and which one we can uh, 
ignore. This is something that is a core of the modal reduction. So if you can do this selection wisely or clever way, you don't really lose much in terms of your computational accuracy. So accuracy will be extremely good, but you will gain a lot in terms of your computational efficiency. So it's an extremely critical question, but unfortunately very difficult to answer, particularly in a general way. But few hints, you know, you know, few things that would make sense you to do. First one is that whatever you're selecting the modes, please visualize them. Visualizing is telling you already quite a bit because if you say that you know you have a structure that um, is like planar structure and it is loaded in uh, this direction, for sure the deformation modes that are in-plane modes are extremely important. But off-plane modes, which I cannot even draw here, will be having no roles at all. So this is the first thing to look at, and also using a common engineering sense think about whether or not it makes sense to keep this kind of mode as a part of the play. So the visualization is important thing. So visualize them. And then once you have these two different types of modes, you have these roughly free free modes and boundary modes that are coming from the static corrections. You know, you can look at them separately and think about whether or not they make some difference to overall performance. Here are a few examples to you. So these are the free free modes. Uh, they are in plain free free modes for sure. They are something that is interesting and important. And then some boundary modes that are, you know, having some heavy local deformation, which too most probably are important when you look at the accurate responses of the structure like this. And now I lost my point. It's here. This too is very similar than the previous one. So both probably are extremely important because forces are introduced to here and here. So it makes sense to have this kind of local deformation, accurate description of local deformation. Um, there are also this automated way to select the modes. And this is what I was implying earlier. I say that there is this technique that is in pretty much all the commercial softwares. What is this automated technique? Well, the automatic technique goes such that um, you can compute how is an overall strain energy of your system. And of course, the strain energy is not going to be the constant value, but it's going to be something that if you make a drawing about time, strain energy, what was the good notation for that? Let's call that as a strain like this. So the strain energy is changing over the course of the simulation. What you could do then is that you can look at the strain energy at any given time. Let's say that <coughs> this is your strain energy at this given time. You can look how this strain energy was constructed by different modes. And it's possible because the strain energy is essentially like this. Oh, strain multiplied by elastic coefficient, strain and this is one divided by two, and this is integrated over the volume. Now, what you can do, the strain here is related to deformation mode. So you can look at how single deformation mode, or better to say how much single deformation mode is, is contributing to the strain energy at given time. So let's say that there is a value, but this is strain energy, value is 100. Let's not speak about the units, but it's 100. First mode is contributing, say, 60. So it's affecting 60% of that deformation. Second mode is affecting, let's say, 0 0.001 to this. So it's next to nothing. So you can ignore it. Then the third one will be, say, 39% or 39 as a numerical value. So you can select the one that is contributing the most and pretty much all the numerical, well, not the numerical, but the commercial softwares have this capability to do this selection automatically. So it goes that the way that you select into threshold value. So it's meaning like, what is a minimum contribution that you're expecting an individual mode to deliver for you? And if it is delivering less than the threshold value, then you're simply ignoring it. So it's using, first of all, all the modes to compute the first work cycle. 
and then it's checking later how much each modes are contributing and it's ignoring the ones that are contributing very little so it's the weakest have to go so this is like rule of the nature so so you first take everyone in the board and later once you are done with your simulation you go back to your simulation results in checking like who was the one that is working the hardest which mode was the most contributing one and you keep them you make sure that they stay in alive and those one that are contributing very little you can kill them ignoring them so that's how it goes now one more thing here a um, few tips about how to verify your flexible body of course it makes sense to compare inertia properties make sure that the weight and inertia properties are without no changes this easily can happen or easily this conversion can introduce some confusions and because of that there may be some changes in inertia properties there shouldn't be any there shouldn't be any and of course it makes sense to compare natural frequencies in the free free modes and compare final element a deformation compare the deformation so you can attach your st flexible structure to your crown in your multi-body code and you can put the fours on it and you can see how much is deformed and that should be roughly the same than in the final element model okay with that let me see how is that we're doing in the in-class quiz so we have 20 answers let me put it back and let me see if we have a game on so we have a game is on and correct solution is one more answer just game here okay i guess that i can close this very nice oh look at that so some late late guys that were coming in so so uh Rotations are assumed to be small. So that's not the case. So we are not saying that rotations are small. The deformations are assumed to be small, nothing to do with us. But reference motion takes care of the rigid body modes. That's the correct answer. That's the whole point of the floating frame reference formulation and the success rate. And I'm going to take a screenshot. That's so much more easier. Why didn't I figure it out that, oh, oh now I'm doing something stupid here. I was not so clever that I didn't figure that out earlier. Uh, here. Oh my God, I think I, I took a wrong, wrong document here. So I need to put this back. Where's the other guy? This guy. This I need to move. All right. Just a second. And I'm going to take a screenshot here. Hopefully it's okay. Looks okay, great. So who's gonna be the winner? So who's gonna be considered as a winner? Well, 77 for sure is gonna be considered as a winner, but you might need to, I think that we need to keep like plus minus two, plus minus two. So you don't need to intentionally put this plus minus two because it will be automatically accounted. Okay, now, uh, the next topic. Mass invariance. Uh, hold on, excuse me, I need to put uh, my soccer theme off here. So it's hidden now. Mass invariance, I said that I'm going to spend five to ten minutes to explain this to you. I believe it was less time than that. Why is this? Well, that's simply because it's mathematically very involving. So it's going to be a nightmare to do this mass invariance. And um, this is something that is still a, kind of like an open research question because this mass invariance, let me first explain what is the deal with this mass invariance. You know, remember the whole thing about what we're doing here is that we're combining finite element 
and multi-body system dynamics. We conclude that the combination of this, these two disciplines or two different approaches will be put together in a floating frame reference formulation. That's not really a good statement because there will there have to be some particular component in equation motion where this combination actually takes a place. We have to do it. And usually you can combine these two approaches either in the description of inertia or in the description of elastic forces. And what we're gonna do here, what is carried out in a floating frame reference formulation, floating frame of reference formulation, is that this coupling, coupling between the final term and the multi-body system dynamics is accomplished in mass matrix. So mass matrix will be looking awful, absolutely awful. And certain components in a mass matrix are remaining constant. And these are called like a mass invariance. And mass invariance are painful thing to compute. Mass invariance are important because typically in a software, the user can affect your mass invariance. And that means like user can make a decision how well or how tightly final term model and multi-body system model are coupled together. So it's kind of weird that the user can make a decision like that, but it's a kind of handy option because you can make a selection such the way that they are completely decoupled, completely decoupled, meaning that body is rigid. And that's going to be by playing with these mass invariants, selecting certain mass invariants to be inactive, and the system will be rigid. Or you can make them loosely connected. That means that the, the behavior may be, may be a little bit unrealistic, but the computation is very fast. Or you can make them fully coupled. Fully coupled meaning that, you know, it's going to be very accurate, but it's going to be computationally demanding to, to compute the flexibility. All that is accounted in mass invariance. So mass invariance is telling you how well finite term model and multi-body system dynamics are combined, are coupled together. Now, the whole story in details is absolutely painful. It's pure pain. And because maybe because of the good weather, I don't know, I don't want to torture you. So I want to simply skim over this, um, or browse over this presentation. And I don't expect you to know anything else except that mass invariants are the one that combines flexibility and the multi-body system dynamics. And you can play with the mass invariants. And when you play with them, you can make the connection to be completely deattached, which means that the bodies are rigid or loosely attached. So it's computationally efficient, but not necessarily very accurate or fully attached. I meaning that that's realistic behavior. Whole story is long. So it's all about how this guy here is described by using deformation modes. And then it goes like this. So I'm combining, I'm going to describe this vector U bar with help of modes and model coordinates. And my model coordinates will be my new set of generalized coordinates. So these are the generalized coordinates that are associated to rigid body motion, reference motion, if you may. And these are the coordinates that are associated to deformation. And then I start playing with these notations. I'm going to compute first velocity like this. And now look at this. This is important. Remember in the rigid multi-body dynamics, we were able to say that this guy was always zero because the vector u bar was a constant. It's no longer a constant. And because it's no longer a constant, you cannot cross that component, but you have to keep it in a play all the time. So it means that the, already the velocity is getting to be a little bit of painful component and it consists of three components. But again, we are not gonna look at the details and I not expect you to, to master the details here. Okay. Then moving on here, then uh, like you have pretty much like you knew what's gonna happen next. We're gonna differentiate the velocity one more time with respect to time to get an acceleration. And acceleration is a pure pain already. So it looks like really nasty and it consists of five components, five components. 
Remember, in the rigid multi-body dynamics, there were only three components. Now, there are two additional that are coming from the fact that this guy, this vector u bar dot, is not constant. And it's not constant because the body can deform. So the new component that comes into play are Coriolis acceleration. Remember the Coriolis acceleration? That is, by the definition, uh, something that the particle moves in a rotating disk. Now, it's possible because the vector u bar is not constant anymore. And the acceleration due to the pure deformation. That's another additional component here. Now, when substituting all that to generalized inertia forces, then what's going to happen is that you finally get your mass matrix and quadratic velocity vector. And they look like really, really nasty stuff. So this is how they look. So the mass matrix consists of six different components. And these six different components have these mass invariants that you can select to be active or, or you can deactivate them. And that tells you how well, again, finite term model and multi-body system dynamics are coupled. So th these are the mass invariants. We are not going to look them in the details. There is, by the way, some recent, recent papers that was published in LUT University about how to compute this mass invariance. So if you want to torture yourself, let me know so I can email the paper to you. So this is how they look. And this is the practical thing. So these are screenshots from, from Adam software. So you can select means the same mass invariance to be active, deactive. And this is simply telling you how well things are combined. Could I skip the in-class quiz related to this? And I'm going to move on to contact modeling. And let me see if you're still alive. Let me see if there's any questions, comments. No comments. OK. All right, next, contact modeling. So this is, again, back to the something that is having a huge amount of practical relevance. And I'm going to introduce you something two new things. So smooth dynamics versus non-smooth dynamics. And it's related to how is that the contacts are described. And also I'm going to introduce you that concept that is called many body dynamics. And many body already I can tell you that is a system that consists of huge number of bodies. And Typically, in the multi-body system dynamics, we're speaking about the bodies where the number of bodies is less than 100. I, it's really hard to see models where the number of bodies is more than 100. But in many body dynamics, we're speaking about the number of bodies, which is roughly a million, hundreds of thousands, tens of millions at best. And they are conceptually very different because the interaction between the bodies is completely different than you're used to deal with. So it's going to be based on contacts, not joints, but contacts. And how the contacts are modeled in many body dynamics? Well, just shortly. I'm going to repeat this many times, but, but we have roughly two choices here. So we can have, if this is a ball, that is, moving downwards due to the gravity. So what we can do is that we can measure x here, which is telling the, the position of the lowest point of the ball with respect to ground. And as soon as the x goes less than a zero, once you know it goes below the surface, it means that there's a certain amount of penetration. This penetration can be used to introduce the force that is pushing this ball back from the ground. And this is something that is smooth dynamics. This is by the one that is based on penalty forces. The forces that is coming into play and pushing bodies back, you know, you know, whether whatever they are coming from. This is a one way to make it happen. And this is called smooth dynamics because these forces acting in a smooth way. So usually when you look at the forces, maybe it would be good to put this as a force like this, and time is here. As a function of time, they typically behave like this. So they're getting started smoothly, 
to have a smooth behavior all the time. Very typical scenario. Alternative way to do the same would be to say, okay, I have here inequality, constraint inequality. So I have I have an equation that says that this ball can do whatever it wants, except penetrate the, this surface. And I can express that by using constraint equation, similar way that joints are described, except that this constraint equation will have inequalities. It could be like that. And this constraint will be accounted in my equation of motion. This is going to be non-smooth dynamics. Non-smooth dynamics because this is going to be moving in unsmooth manner in this case. So let's take a look at the details of this in a second, but uh, let's first look a little bit about background. Contact modeling. Uh, so the contact modeling is extremely often used concept, and you need it when you're developing games, when you are playing games, you're using them. So it's something that is coming with a huge practical value. And this is from the very old game, so this is not any of the recent games, but this is flat out game. So in just, you know, how they, how even in uh, this kind of rally games, the contacts are described. Is this accurate? Well, I don't take any opinion in that regard, but it's it looks okay. So it looks okay because, you know, when the television is hitting to roof of the car, even the suspensions goes a little bit downwards. Are they really going that much? Maybe not in the real life, but, um, but it looks okay. It looks okay. And that's what we're going to look. We're going to look at the contact modeling in a larger perspective, not just in a multi-body system dynamics, but also a little bit about how that is handled in uh, um, games, uh, how that is handled also a little bit about in final element modeling. Okay, so, so that's an introduction slide. Contact modeling, this is extremely important too to be aware of. So the contact modeling consists of two steps, contact detection and event modeling. Both are extremely important. So the contact detection, to give you an idea like why this is important, well, you know, let's look at the rally game. You know, we have a road that is like traveling like this. And then I have a car here. The car is moving along this road. And, you know, this road is surrounded by trees. So there's a two trees here, one more here, one more here, one more here, and so on and so forth. And eventually there's going to be a lot of objects where the car can hit or possibly can have a contact with. And what we could do then is that we can have a, some kind of vector, like remember here we are measuring the distance of this ellipsoidal shape from the crowd. So we could have our vectors that are measuring how far off is this tree here. And we can have X here. And as soon as the X goes below the zero, then we know that there's a contact. Or we can have it the same vector here and all these places. But because there is so many possible contacts, eventually this is no longer doable ways ago. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to look at this method anymore because there will be millions and, not millions, but a lot of different vectors that are all measuring possible contacts. You need to compute these vectors every single time step. So this is not CPU, I mean, in a computational perspective, this is not making any sense. So we need to make more clever way to do it. And this is what the contact detection is about. So it's a computationally efficient way to figure it out whether or not there's a contact. And if there's a contact, then you're moving on to next phase of your contact modeling, which is a contact event itself. And a contact event itself, basically we have two choices. So we can use these penalty forces that are forces like I explained. And the forces are pushing bodies away from each other. Or we can use constraint. We can use this con complementary approach where we introducing constraints and the constraints are not allowing bodies to have a parent trace. So those are the two different ways. But again, first we have two phases in a contact modeling, contact detection and contact event modeling. 
All right. Let me see. So is uh, 131. Okay, what I'm going to do today is that uh, <laughs> no, what I'm going to do today, I, I was just checking the comment that uh, more skipping soccer thieves uh, will be pleasant to you. No worries, you know, it's not so serious game. This soccer thief is a part of the fun, so no worries. So I was just thinking that I'm going to explain a little bit about this contact detection and then uh, it seems that I'm unable to move on to contact even. So maybe I'm going to close this in a halfway of the explanation and continue on. Well, not sure when I can continue because the next week Adam will be here. Might need to think about that. So maybe, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure, but let's just move on and see how it goes. Okay, contact detection. Bounding box method is very often used. And I'm sure that if you are familiar with the game technology, you have heard about this bounding box method before. What, what's the concept of the bounding box? Well, idea is to use boxes. Well, as the title implies, but the boxes in a way that uh, there's gonna be bigger boxes and smaller boxes, and you will simply put your objects inside of the boxes and bigger the box you know that then the higher in the levels you go and then you're just um, comparing the different levels of boxes and checking whether or not there's this possibility of having contacts okay i think this was a fall course or even earlier than that we look a little bit about the, the crane simulator and the crane simulator is the something that this particular device which is attaching the containers or is attached to containers is moving in a harbor environment so bounding box method in this particular case would mean that you were gonna introduce a big box which is of course not the box but the hype you know imaginary box which is a very big in a size and you put your entire device in, inside of that box, all right? Then there's gonna be an even bigger box. You know, maybe there's a ship here and the ship will be inside of the bigger, huge box here. Sorry that the drawing is a little bit unclear, but let's say that there's a ship and ship is inside of the big box here. And now what you're gonna do is that you're comparing whether or not these two boxes can have a contact and that's going to be the root level of the bounding box method so you're checking out whether or not this big object can have a possibility of contact if no contact that's it so that's end of the story no need to proceed from that if they are penetrating then you need to move on to next level at the next level to get an understanding about that Let's take this off. There are smaller boxes inside of the big box. And in these smaller boxes, they are maybe like these components that are, you can lift and put it down. They are inside of the box. So this is gonna be branch level box. So if the bigger boxes are colliding, then you're moving on to branch level boxes. And if the branch level boxes, these smaller boxes are colliding too. And again, you know, there could be this big box which there's a ship inside and the ship details are inside of the smaller boxes. If the smaller boxes are colliding, penetrating, you're moving on to leaf level, which is a drawing primitives level. And then you're checking, are they really colliding? And if yes, that's it. That's all what the bounding box method is doing to you is telling that, is there a contact? And if there is a contact, where the contact takes a place, nothing else. And it's based on these different levels of boxes, the different size of, well, levels is a better to say, not sizes. Okay, the boxes can be put, or objects can be put inside of the boxes in a different ways. And this is where the different variations of the method comes. So we can use uh, 
axis align bounding boxes and we can use oriented bounding boxes axis align bounding boxes is a coarse and fast cpu efficient well these are the different ways you know what are the different opportunities how is that you can put your object inside of the box you don't need to know that in detail but just just that you know that what is a concept of the bounding box that will be enough all right now let's move on so once you know that okay yes there is a contact there is a contact then we need to look what's going to happen next contact description will be the next item to describe of course if we would have everything described as a deformable bodies this will be a very simple thing to do then we will simply say that okay you know these two bodies can will have a let's say these two two have a contact here and they couldn't have it they don't have a penetration so it will be very accurate and very simple to do it like this but in real life we practically never dealing with the flexible bodies but we are dealing with the contact between the rigid bodies and um, because we're dealing with the rigid bodies then this deformation these undeformable models have to be treated in a little bit of different way so they may have this imaginary penetration imaginary penetration which is not of course happening in real life but this is kind of kind of pretending or having prediction a little bit the same way what happens in a deformable models okay i know that there's a little bit of unclear explanation but it hopefully becomes to be more clear when we are looking at these two ways and now I see that I have eight minutes left in today's lecture. Hmm. Penalty force is. I think what I will do is that um, I'm going to keep today's lecture a bit short here. I'm going to close it here because I want to have these penalty forces and this. Uh, non-smooth way this based the method based on the constraints i would like to explain them in the same day so just just to emphasize the differences between these two methods so uh, i'm gonna close today's lecture here uh, next not monday but what is today wednesday adam klodowski will explain about the biomechanics and i'm gonna spend 10 minutes after 15 minutes after his lecture to explain about rest of the contact description and uh, so i'm sorry that i was unable to finish the story but kind of sense that you are maybe released relieved about that so you are not so sorry at all so let me close today's streaming here i'm going to send you a teams session invitation momentarily so if you have any questions any comments see me in the teams Otherwise, see me, uh, see me, not me, but Adam in the same channel next week, Wednesday, same time, which is at 12.15. All right. So thank you and uh, see you soon in the Teams. Oh, there is here. Yeah.